75 years since its founding. The People's Republic of China has transformed itself from backwater to an economic powerhouse. The country now embarks on a new journey as it navigates a complex global landscape, shifts to high quality development, and advances modernization through deeper reforms and a revolutionary innovation. Join CGTN as we chronicle China's milestones from more than seven and a half decades of growth and transformation. Our special report, New China, 75 years on, only on CGTN. Celebrating 75 years of the People's Republic of China, CGTN brings you the story of a nation's remarkable transformation. From automated factories to cutting-edge labs, China is reshaping the global manufacturing. With a commitment to openness, China welcomes international investment. Driving collaboration on a global scale. From green hills to clear waters. China safeguards nature for generations to come. Across rural homelands, agricultural modernization is building progress and prosperity. Throughout, China's rich cultural heritage continues to thrive. A timeless legacy interwoven with the nation's story of modernization. Experience 75 years of innovation, unity and vision. Only with CGTN. On uh, October the 1st, the People's Republic of China will celebrate the 75th anniversary of its founding. And to mark this occasion, CGTN presents its special coverage, Way to Modernization. And our anchors and reporters are traveling five routes across the country, covering 16 provinces and municipalities in 20 days. Way to Modernization discusses uh, the significant developments that have transformed China's economy, culture, environment and agriculture over the last seven and a half decades. Today we focus on China's biodiversity protection efforts. My colleagues Zhong Shi and Feng Yilei join us live in Yichang, a city along the Yangtze River in central China's Hubei province. Hello everyone, welcome to our special program today. I am super excited, guess where I am? This might look like a museum, this might look like an aquarium, but I'm actually at the Three Gorges Rare Fish Conservation Center. The main goal of the center is to protect and conserve the rare fish species in the Yangtze River, especially those on the verge of extinction. It also aims to ensure their survival to maintain the biodiversity in the Yangtze River ecosystem. So what special fish do they have here and what does conservation look like? I'm now joined by Dr. Yang Ding, a researcher at the center. Dr. Yang, fantastic to have you on our special program today. Really good to have you joining us. Why don't we start with this fish right here. We know this species is from the upper reaches of the Yangtze River. Dr. Yang, what more can you tell us? Yeah, it's a typical fish living in the upper stream of the Yangtze River and it has adapted to the local environment such as low temperature. So the growth speed for this fish is quite slow, but they are very good at evading behind stones. And in this way, they cannot uh, easily be swept away by turbulent water flows. Understood. Dr. Yang was telling me that this species is quite coy and quite shy, and it turns out it's a basic survival skill, a survivor instinct of mm -hmm. this fish right here. And mm -hmm. now we move on to this fish. It's very special because the color of their body can change as they reach maturity. The Chinese name is Yan Zhi Yu, which roughly translates into rouge fish. Dr. Yang, how did it get its name? 
Yeah, it's root fish. Uh, actually, it has another English name. It's a Chinese sucker. Mm. And as you mentioned just now, it's very interesting because the um, uh, physical appearance of this fish can change with age. And what we can see now here is the juvenile forum. And there are three vertical lines around its body. But when it grows up, these vertical lines will disappear, and a horizontal line will show up on each side of its body surface. Mm. And when it's ready for propagate, the color of its whole body will turn to root. So mm. that's why we call them root fish. Isn't that magical? The patterns, the stripes on the bodies of this fish will change. Dr. Yang, now that we've gotten to know two species of the rear fish here at the yeah. center, can you help us understand what conservation uh, looks like at this stage. We know water is important. This water is actually from the Yance River filtered to fill the tanks. The temperature of the water is also important. What else, Dr. Yang? Uh, yes, all the temperatures in these tanks are regulated because we are trying our best to, to provide a proper uh, environment mm. as close to their a natural environment as possible mm. and we want to make sure they can successfully grow and propagate under artificial conditions. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Now we're approaching a larger tank now that houses some familiar carp fish. Um, these are known as the four major domestic fish here in China or four um, mm -hmm. uh, economic fish we call them. Dr. Yang, they're not as uh, rare. They're not as precious. They're actually quite common. Why are you having them here at the center? What is the uh, purpose for studying them? Actually, due to the global environmental change, uh, fish wide resources, most fish wide resources have declined, including economic fish. So, in addition to the conservation of rare fish species, we also pay attention to the protection of uh, ecological, uh, economic fish species. Mm. And um, we started um, ecological regulation for the four major Chinese carps since 2011. Mm. And this regulation is quite uh, effective in boosting the propagation for these carps. Mm. And according to our data, the number of uh, their eggs in the Yangtze River in recent years is about a uh, hundred times higher than it before 2011. That's incredible, yeah. real results. Um, obviously, the center houses many more rear species. Next, we're going to show you the star at the center, a living fossil that has existed for over 140 million years. People call them the giant panda in the water, whose condition has improved dramatically thanks to conservation efforts, including um, artificial breeding here at the center. And that is the Chinese sturgeon. Coming up, you're going to see a specimen of this beautiful creature right here. This mm -hmm. is a specimen of the Chinese sturgeon. You can get a sense of just how big um, this species is. You know what? If you stick around, we're going to show you living individuals of the Chinese sturgeon right here at the center, so don't go anywhere. But before that, now that we're on the topic of ecological protection, my colleague Ku Chao has made her way to the Shenongjia National Nature Reserve, also here in Hubei province. Why don't we take a look at her report, and then we're going to show you Chinese sturgeons. Take a look. Dr. Zaman came to study in China from Pakistan. He's been doing research in the forest of Shenongjia National Nature Reserve for about nine months. He studies the urine of the golden snub-nosed monkeys, an endangered species under the first level national protection in China. I love monkeys and want to protect them. For me, it's not just words, but action. I've been working hard to collect and study their urine samples to check their health conditions. It contributes to the thesis I'm writing, which is helpful for protection of the species. The golden snub-nosed monkey is a signature species of the Shenongjia Nature Reserve. It was once threatened by a shrinking and fragmented habitat. Dr. Zaman said he's impressed by Chinese experts' dedication to protecting nature. China's done great in protecting its wildlife. I've seen people working hard to protect the reserve, so I believe the species of golden snub-nosed monkeys will thrive. 
Chinese experts have been observing and researching the golden subnose, the monkeys, for decades. Living and working in the woods is never easy. Well, thanks to their efforts and love for the species, the number of the monkeys has risen to 1,600, triple of what it was in 1990. Habitat of the golden snub-nosed monkeys has now been expanded almost two times compared to 20 years ago. Experts say Shenlongjia holds significant ecological value due to its rich biodiversity. Its varied ecosystems promote genetic diversity and resilience to climate change. Local officials have employed multiple measures to conserve the reserve's unique environment. Aiming to ensure the integrity and authenticity of the reserve's natural ecosystems, we've implemented zoning management, enacted protection regulations, and launched innovative initiatives. We've also boosted cooperation and exchanges at home and abroad, including partnerships with the United Nations Environment Program and over 40 domestic universities. Statistics show the restored areas in Shenlongjia have reached up to more than 20 million square meters, and its forest coverage rate has risen to 96 percent. Hu Chao, CGTN, Hubei Province. Welcome back, everyone. Now I've caught up with my colleague Feng Yile here. We are in this sprawling breeding workshop, and Yile, I did promise our viewers that they would be seeing living Chinese sturgeon here in the workshop. Well, keeping to your word, here we are face to face with the real live Chinese sturgeons. Well, just look at those majestic creatures. It is just incredible to think how these living fossils first emerged about 140 million years ago are uh, right here with us. Mm. Uh, but these aren't wild Chinese sturgeons, are they? Mm. They are the results of artificial breeding here at the center, which has been a success a success story, really. And we're seeing some activity here in the pond. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Yang, could you please explain to us briefly what these experts are doing right there? Yeah, my colleagues are doing routine examination of the Chinese sturgeon. They are measuring the fish body length and checking whether they are healthy. Mm. So this routine checkup, a medical checkup sort of for humans, is only a, an element of a very lengthy process protecting and conserving the Chinese sturgeons. Um, can you help us understand other crucial tasks involved in this process? Uh, yes, the routine examination is only a small part, part in our work. And uh, the ultimate goal for, uh, for us is to recover the wide resources for the Chinese sturgeon. Mm -hmm. So there are two main tasks for us. The first one is artificial breeding. We cultivate a sustainable population under artificial conditions, and it's also the basis for the recovery of wider resources. The second one is releasing. We release the Chinese sturgeon into the natural environment every year. And in the past three years, the annual releasing number for the Chinese sturgeon is more than 200,000. 200, and up to now, the total releasing number is up to more than 6 million individuals. Well, that is a lot. And speaking of releasing, um, I'm really curious, once they are um, released and returned to um, Yangtze River and even the ocean, how would you then monitor them in a natural environment? Actually, we usually use different uh, tags to mark the um, release of individuals, and uh, uh, including Pianki tag, oh. as we can see over there. I think there. they're doing it right yeah. now. So these are relatively young sturgeons here in the pond, about three years old, and it looks like they already have those markings, they already have these tags with them. So as part of the medical checkup, they can scan um, the tag, and yeah. a number will come up, that yep. number has all the information about this particular individual. Yes, yeah, so we can check the uh, individual information through the number uh, of the fish. Yeah. Mm. And uh, uh, besides the PIG tag, we also use uh, sonar and the satellite tag to help us to track in the swim route for the release of the individual. Mm. And I assume that when you talk about um, the information it carries, it also in uh, includes the uh, their age. So for these sturgeons, they are about 
um, three years. Yeah. Now. And that pretty much makes them still babies of Chinese sturgeons, I think. But um, when they reach maturity, as you said, breeding uh, is also going to be a critical issue, maybe not just for these individuals, but for the survival of the entire species, right? So could you please maybe share with us some of the major breakthroughs the team has made so far in breeding technologies? Yeah, the, um, I mean, the life pattern for the Chinese starting quite long, so the pro, uh, tactical process is quite hard. But I would like to share two events with you guys. The first um, event was uh, in 1984 why the Chinese sturgeon was successfully propagated in our institute with our help. And from that time, we started to release individuals into the Yangtze River. Mm. Another event is in 2009, mm. and in that year, the first fish fry of the second filial generation of Chinese sturgeon in China was the first born in our institute. And this means that the conservation of Chinese sturgeon are no longer depend on wide resources. Mm. Dr. Yang, I want to say a quick congratulations on those remarkable achievements made possible through you and your colleagues' hard work. But what mm. about the future? What is the longer-term goal in your work here at the center? What would be an ideal outcome? Well, I think we will continue to the conservation of more endangered fish species, and there are um, they might many key steps in the future. But I think they may uh, include, but not limited to three aspects. The first one is performing scientific research using advanced uh, technologies and uh, biological methods, and it will help us to improve the quality and quantity. Uh, of our artificial population. The second uh, aspect is uh, keeping releasing, and it, it uh, will effectively improve the wide resources. And the third aspect is to conducting public benefit activities. We want to, and we would like to, introduce these fish species to the public. And we hope uh, the public can understand and can or can recognize the importance of the this beautiful and precious species living on the earth and with all uh, our efforts so we want to uh, build a beautiful world homeland for all to live in harmony beautiful work incredible work best wishes to you dr young and Thanks. to your colleagues uh -huh. And I think it's just encouraging to see all the efforts that the team has made to safeguard not just this one species, but the rich biodiversity of the Yangtze River ecosystem. It's an honor and a privilege for us reporters to witness such personal and professional dedication right here at the center and to bring to you the tangible results of China's ecological protection. And perhaps that's also enough to um, just inspire each of us to keep in mind that human progress and natural conservation can go hand in hand and then consider what we can do to protect the treasures of our modern nature. Remember, that's a crucial element of the Chinese path for modernization, the harmonious coexistence between man and nature. And with that, we come to the end of our special coverage today. Thank you so much for watching. Let's send it back over to Dongning in Beijing. Amazing sturgeon and uh, the local ecological conservation efforts there. Yes, and they're right. We we should always remember that men are part of nature. We need to uh, protect our mother nature as much as we can. Now.